I'm Dr. John Parnell, and I was a lecturer in the Department of Zoology at the University of the West Indies in Kingston, Jamaica, from 1962 until 1985. During that time, I was instrumental in developing a new entomology section of the zoology department, and the university began to issue both undergraduate and postgraduate awards in applied entomology. My research interests included studies on the conservation of Terorus homerus, the giant swallowtail, an endemic butterfly that only occurs in Jamaica in two restricted, heavily forested, mountainous regions. In order to attract attention to the conservation of this species, I decided to produce a documentary video showing all of the immature stages of this butterfly. This involved making several trips accompanied by both undergraduate and postgraduate students, Eric Garraway, of which was one of them. And we went into the John Crow Mountains in the eastern end of the island to produce this video. Eventually, the video was completed just before I left Jamaica in 1985. And an updated version of this video can still be seen on YouTube under the title Terorus Homerus Swallowtail Life Cycle in Jamaica. After I left the island in 1985, Eric Garraway obtained his PhD and took over my position as a lecturer at the university. He also carried on the research into Terorus Homerus. And I will let the now Dr. Eric Garraway continue to describe the studies that have been made on this species in the last few years. When John Parnell invited me to join him on an expedition to the Rio Grande Valley in 1984 in search of Jamaica's vanishing swallowtail, he said to me that if I ever see this butterfly, my life will be changed forevermore. It sounded like an old wives' tale. But one year later, when John left Jamaica, I was immediately promoted to the position of chief homerous man in Jamaica. My life was changed from that time onwards. I had had quite a help along the way, and a lot of it came from Dr. Adit Bailey, who worked with me as my research assistant as we tried to unravel the reasons why this butterfly was endangered. There were several theories. One was that there's a shortage of larval food plants. Secondly, there's a shortage of primary forest which the butterfly requires. Next, there were genetic problems with the small populations. And finally, there was too much collection and sale of individuals. So let's look at these theories. First, was there a shortage of larval food plant? We found two larval food plants, Hernanda catartifolia and Hernanda jamicensis, neither of which were rare. So in fact, there was no need for legal protection. There might be need for to augment the number of plants, but they were by no means rare. Was there a shortage of primary forest? The answer is, Homerus is not restricted to primary forest. This from even among agricultural plots. What seems more important is moist forest with regular rainfall and high humidity. There are some areas like the Spanish River Valley and the Dolphin Head Mountains, which have, which have Hernandia, but no Homerus because of the extensive dry season. 
the need for water, for regular water supply, is crucial. And here we can see a larva actually drinking water from off the surface of a leaf. If there isn't enough water, when the ad adults emerge from the pupae, there will not be enough fluid to stretch those great wings. Next question. What were the mortality factors regulating numbers? This is a new question. But we found several mortality factors. We found fungi. We found predators such as ants and lizards. We found bacteria. But the ones which fascinated us most, fascinated us most, were three species of tiny wasps that attacked the eggs. And what was rather special is that in undisturbed habitats, in really good forests, they cause 47% mortality among the eggs. But in the disturbed habitats, these tiny wasps would kill as much as 90%, and in some cases, even much as 95 to 97% of the eggs. But the story doesn't stop there. We find that more humorous eggs are deposited in these disturbed habitats, in the open clearings. Females spend more time here, and in fact, three times as much eggs are deposited in these open areas, disturbed areas, compared to the undisturbed areas. When we combine this, we have a rather interesting scenario. In this diagram, the upper circle represents undisturbed habitats, and here, 53% of the eggs survive these parasitoids. And the females that continue to use these undisturbed habitats would, would produce viable populations. On the other side, where most of the females seem to go, however, the survival is 10%, and in some cases, even as low as 5 or 3%. When you add other mortality factors to such a generation, you find that in some cases, no, you find that there's almost little or no survival from some of these generations. In other words, these disturbed habitats are like sinks. Eggs go in, but nothing comes out. A consequence of that would be the balance between the amount of disturbed habitats available compared to the undisturbed habitats. This might, be, this might be the key factor determining the survival of the species. Next question. Are there genetic problems associated with the humerus populations? We launched a humerus genetic uh, project to answer some of these questions. And the aim is to work out if we should treat humerus as a single species, two distinct subspecies, or two distinct species. John joined me in 2018, in the summer of 2018, we took out a team of graduates and undergraduate students to try and answer this question. And here we can see some of the students having their first close encounter with Homerus. I suspect their lives might be changed forever. We take very tiny clippings from the wings. It does very little to the animal because they are accustomed to losing vast amount of wings, as you can see in the lower right here. Here we are in the cockpit country, and there's Damien staring into the top of the canopy, hoping and hoping. Here are the results of 2018 work so far. Eastern population, three days. We had 15 wing samples. Huge amount, we didn't expect that many in three days. But notice something, we saw 35 adults, uh, at least 35 adult sightings on one day, extraordinary. In the Western population, two days, we had only seven sightings and were able to capture two specimens. So we have two wing samples from that area. These are now stored at the University of the Western States. The project has been delayed due to the COVID pandemic. 
we resume later this year and hopefully we'll complete the project next year. And here is John finishing that video, which is now online called Terrorus Fumarus, the genetic project. Next question we had to answer, how much collection and sale of specimens existed? Well, in 1984, there's a well-established commercial butterfly collector in Millbank and one other on the other side of the mountain based on the tongue of Bath. There were no laws protecting the species, so this was not illegal. This was not uh, something that was illegal. But in order to reduce this, we launched a campaign in the latter part of the 80s. We had a series of seminars, field trips. We showed John's video, The Vanishing Swallowtail. NGOs like the Natural History Society of Jamaica and the Geographical Society joined in. And by the end of the 80s, we had some major legal changes. We had the amendment to the Wildlife Protection Act to include Homeras. We had the establishment of a protected area system, 1990, and a major revision of the environmental laws. Meanwhile, Homeras emerged as a flagship species. It has not yet been declared a national butterfly, but it is used as such. Here it is on the logo of the National Park, a bumper sticker, special issue of stamps on the $1,000 Jamaican bill. Miss World Pageant, Miss Jamaica World Pageant 2010, her, her costume is inspired by that butterfly. The Forestry Department of Jamaica utilized it on its, some of its posters. So we have had some big steps, but still issues to resolve. Let's start with the Western population, the cockpit country population. The truth is, we know very little about this population. We, there has been no intensive study, studies so far limited almost totally to short visits. We have no credible estimate of population size. But the cockpit country is vast. It's about 10, 12 percent of Jamaican's total land, land area. And the government, sorry, and it has been self-protecting to a great extent, self-protecting to a great extent because of its ruggedness. The biggest challenge here might be bauxite mining or probably limestone mining. Why the parliament has taken steps and designated a cockpit country protected area. And here we see the Prime Minister in Parliament during this debate. But not long after, there's a news flash, green light for bauxite mining in the cockpit country. That's a conflict there. Why the conflict? On this map, the inner core we see here is the area designated by the government as cockpit country. The outer green areas environmentalist thing should be included. And in fact, this area in that red oval has recently been uh, recently been designated an area for bauxite mining. There was a massive protest against bauxite against this bauxite mining proposal. But there's a counter protest supporting the bauxite mining. Meanwhile, Homer has emerged again in his normal role as one of the key species. Here we see it on stickers and on various posts. Why bauxite mining in the cotton country? This is because the economy is in a very precarious state and there are very few economic options available to the government. From a conservationist point of view, we have the possibility of slowly chipping away at these natural habitats. And for Homeras, every pit matters. If we turn to the Eastern population, when in 1992 to 1999, myself and Audit Bailey, we established and maintained the Rio Grande field station. Because you are embedded in the community, we're able to conduct a serious community-based environmental program. 
we were joined by rangers from Blue and John for Mountains National Park. As a result of that, the community emerged as protector of the species. They said no to poaching. Yes to environmentally friendly farming. And in that, they said, save Hernandez. Do not cut Hernandez as you farm. There are other community activities. There's the formation of the Bowden Pen Farmers Association. And environmental management soon became one of their aims. The group engaged in several things, including reforestation of several hectares of cleared hillsides. And in, in these reforestation program, they included many Hernandez plants. They also got involved in ecotourism. They managed a number of hiking trails, established an eco lodge, and all of this allowed for exchange of ideas between researchers, between visitors and themselves. There are comedy school groups. And at nights, it's time for the grand rap session between community members and visitors. But there's trouble in paradise. A number of things have changed. We have lost some key leaders. We have lost land for farming. There's a general economic slowdown. And there's a new generation with a new perspective on life. So exactly what is the present situation? The Farmers Association is collapsing or has collapsed. Ambassadors and the trails are in disarray. The forest department is taking back the land utilized by farmers. There's really no clear economic pathway if you were a youth. Not surprisingly, we have reemergence of poaching. And sadly, we do not have an active conservation education program. Let's look briefly at these communities. They are predominantly farming. They have as fair of things from the forest, but by and large, they have, they exist below the poverty line. The standard of living could not be considered acceptable. The community has given a lot. The nation has given little in return. We need to go forward by providing economic opportunities. For example, agro-processing. This is being discussed presently. Tourism, which is another big part of the Jamaican economic landscape. Probably we should have more of that in Rio Grande. But ecotourism has not been really a big major economic player in Rio Grande Valley. Why is that so? When we look at Jamaican tourism, it's based on sun, sea, and sand. And ecotourism has not been really successful in Jamaica. There are very few profitable ecotourism companies and they make relatively small profits. The tourists coming to Jamaica are not interested in a rustic lodging or interested in hiking. So we need an alternative approach to tourism to get monies, get tourism monies into the valley. We suggest butterfly farming and rather than take the tourists to the valley, we take the butterflies to the tourists. We integrate the university to provide scholarly work and, 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 and leadership. So in conclusion, we have come a long way from the days of the butterfly men with nets openly roaming the forest, when we had no legal protection, when there are no management of the area. But today, we face shrinking of the cockpit country. And the communities that were the protectors of the environment now need our help and research must continue. But finally, I think the last word should be 35 homers in one day, unbelievable.